Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So good evening, everyone. Um, let me pick up on uh, what Rick was raising. I want to I want to say a few things about the midterm elections, and then some deeper problems. So first of all, the midterm elections, the turnout was 41 percent of the electorate. Uh, for a midterm election, uh, that was roughly, I believe, the same that we had in 2006 um, in the prior midterm elections. Uh, there was, as Rick was pointing out, um, there was a significant drop in turnout. Uh, for example, the youth vote was half of what it was in 2008, uh, but the youth that voted voted overwhelmingly for Democrats which is an interesting point. Uh, each of, almost all of the elections were themselves, as was earlier raised, close. Now that's very, very important because leading up to the election, there had been weeks and weeks of propaganda in the media that was basically saying that this was gonna be a tsunami. Uh, and the, um, the Democratic voters were not inspired, mobilized, et cetera. And yet, when the elections took place, you had very tight elections. My, uh, I had a very strange emotional reaction after the elections. Leading up to the elections, I was incredibly worried. And the day after the elections, I was actually incredibly calm. Uh, because what I realized was that this situation is completely volatile. And that in 2012, it could absolutely flip in uh, the other direction, depending on a number of circumstances. All right, three points about the other uh, points about the election. One is that it was a victory for money. The Citizens United uh, Supreme Court decision opened up uh, a, um, a wave of money that flowed into the election. Now, one thing that's important to be very clear on is that money has always been a very important factor in U.S. elections, uh, making our elections some of the best elections that money can buy. The, um, the problem was that now, because of the election, the, this Supreme Court decision, there's different ways that wealthy can participate in a much more covert means. And this is what uh, I think makes this particularly uh, dangerous. A second point is that this was a victory for the right in terms of mobilization. So what did they mobilize? Uh, contrary to the way that the media uh, portrayed the so-called Tea Party movement uh, in the early, early to mid-2009, the Tea Party movement was not a movement of the angry white worker. It was a movement of, uh, first and foremost, hardcore Bush supporters. So the polls that were conducted in later 2009, early 2010, indicated that the core of the Tea Party were Bush supporters. People that, it, it's, it's not like they were Obama supporters that felt betrayed and said, woe is me, now we're gonna flip to the right. These were people that never agreed with Obama. A second uh, aspect here was that within the Tea Party movement, but also more broadly, you had um, irrationalism. And I'll give you an example of one of the uh, slogans that emerged during healthcare debate out of the right. Government hands off of Medicare. Um, now, you know, I, I don't know how familiar everyone is with Medicare, but, but it's a government program. So the notion of government hands off of Medicare is completely uh, out of touch. There's other examples of irrationalism that I could get into. A third thing which uh, is related to the issue of demonization that Rick raised is race. So that within a month or so following the inauguration of Obama, the right started using race in various means as a, as a way of going after uh, Obama. And they did it, it was interesting, it was among other things you had fascists, crypto fascists like Glenn Beck talking about 
Obama is anti-white. But then you had also the rise of the birther movement that questioned whether Obama actually had been born in the United States, or as we were discussing before this meeting, whether he had been born in a foreign country like Hawaii. Um, and so there was the, you know, this whole racial spin here and the right wing using this theme of we want our country back. And back from whom? That was the question. Uh, the media played a very, very important role. Now you have propaganda outfits like Fox, which don't even bother playing uh, as if they were objective. But what's also interesting is not so much the extreme right in the media, but the more mainstream forces that gave an inordinate amount of time to the right, including but not limited to the, um, uh, the Tea Party forces. And then there's this issue of the fear within the middle strata, the white middle strata. That is that uh, what's interesting there was that people that not who had not necessarily been hurt by the crisis in any dramatic ways, losing jobs, nevertheless their fear of what might be coming down the road ended up playing a, a major role in mobilizing them. Third point the uh, demobilization of Obama support. And I don't want to repeat everything that Rick raised, but I, um, I want to just mention a couple of things. On a tactical level, Obama made a very, very serious mistake that Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan did not make, which is that uh, in part because, in my opinion, his psychological makeup he did not focus on what he had inherited. In fact, very quickly after taking over, there was very little attention to what had preceded him, making it that much easier for the right to turn the entire economic crisis into Obama's economic crisis. This doesn't relieve him of other things, but it's a tactical mistake. Um, there was also on his part what I have been calling premature compromising. We saw this again and again and again, including in the health care debate, where uh, immediately Obama removed Medicare for all or single payer health care from the table, from discussion. He pulled this off and said, essentially, if we were in some other magical land and we could start from scratch, single payer would make sense, but we don't. Therefore, we're going to uh, start from where we are. That followed by compromising on what was called a public option um, really hit at uh, an important component of his base. But there were other uh, forms of compromise. Now, all of these, I think, contributed to the, the results in the midterm elections. But I want to, uh, in my final couple of minutes, say this about uh, where I think that the fundamental mistakes were made. The fundamental mistakes were made by the progressive forces and liberals that had supported Obama in 2008 and failed to hold them accountable. So this is another side of what Rick was raising. He was saying that Obama did not build the base. I'm saying, and not in contradiction, that the base did not hold him accountable did not keep the pressure on him. There's a very famous story that takes place uh, sometime between 1939 and 1941 in which there was a discussion between a leading African-American labor person, A. Philip Randolph, and then President Franklin Roosevelt. And in this discussion, Randolph lays out a series of programmatic reforms that he wants Roosevelt to enact. At the end of listening to this, Roosevelt says, I agree. Now go out there, organize, and make me do it. Um, in fact, that's exactly what Randolph did. But that's not what happened after Obama was elected, in part because there was, in my humble opinion, a misassessment of who Obama was. When, in the lead up to the election, when I was asked by many people, if Obama wins, how much of a honeymoon period should we give him? How much of a breathing period should we give him? My answer was 24 hours. And everybody laughed. 
And they said, no, Bill, I'm serious. How, how much time? I said, no, 24 hours. I said, for the first 24 hours, we should party like there's no tomorrow. And on the 25th hour, we should, there is an expression, and I don't know whether this translates, be on his case like white on rice. In other words, we should not give him any space because there will immediately be pressure from the right on Obama. And within the first 24 hours of his election, that's exactly what happened. That is, we partied and the other side put the pressure. The um, Obama went to Larry Summers, who should never have been asked to be close to government. He should have been given a position in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, where he could have contemplated ice flows. Um, but instead, he was being encouraged. His name was being floated as possible Treasury Secretary. And while he was not appointed, it didn't matter because he was brought into the inner circle. A right-wing Democrat named Rahm Emanuel was tapped to become the chief of staff. This is in the first 24 hours. So we're partying, talking about this great historic victory. And there were things that were happening that indicated the way that this administration might go. So the problem, I would argue, was that the liberal and progressive forces did not put the heat on and in, instead had been looking at the Obama candidacy sometimes, and this may sound like an exaggeration, as if this was the second coming, as if he was in fact the Messiah. You know, I was reading something the other day that reminded me that when Oprah Winfrey backed Obama, she made a comment, something to the effect of, uh, I had to decide whether he was the one, and he is the one. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the Matrix trilogy, <laughs> you'll remember who the one, right? Neo, right? He was the person that was going to resolve everything for, for humanity. That, that o Oprah may not have meant it in a literal sense, but for many people that really did register that this was the person that was going to resolve our problems for us and that we did not have to mobilize. People saw in Obama what they wanted to see. For many of us to also borrow again from science fiction, Obama was a changeling. That is, he, his form altered, largely in this case, depending on who was looking at him. And so, for example, in a question of the wars, we heard that he was against the Iraq war, but many people refused to hear him when he said that he was actually in favor of expanding the war in Afghanistan, that he was in favor of attacking Pakistan if necessary, because we did not want to hear that. What we wanted to hear was that he was an anti-war candidate. And this led to, again, a demobilization. I come out of the union movement, among other things, and one of, the, what, one of the things that I saw repeated again and again and again was a failure on the part of the union movement to stay on Obama's case. And the problem was the failure of the movement to do this led to despair within our ranks because people were expecting more and when the leaders of various social movements themselves would not keep Obama accountable, the troops returned to the barracks. I'll stop there. <laughs>